Hi everybody. Hello. Hello. Thank you. Um, I'm here to speak about unknown unknowns and how to know them. My name is Dylan Ratcliffe. I'm the founder and CEO of Overmind. I was previously a professional services engineer at Puppet. Um, but before I talk too much about that, um, I just want to tell you the story of uh, how a printer made me quit my job. <laughs> If you've spoken, to, if you've, I've spoken to you before, you've probably heard this story, so forgive me, but I'm going to go over it again. Um, so, while I was a consultant at Puppet, I was working for a week at a company that will remain nameless, um, and the gig was going really well. But we wanted to get a big win before I left, and at the time, every server had the same root password. <laughs> good groan. Good job. Uh, and it was this sort of secret arcane knowledge that got passed down on your first day in the operations team and you weren't to tell anyone because it had never been changed and it was never going to get changed. And uh, it was really not a good position to be in. So we were planning to deploy Triple SD, which would mean that users could log in with their username and password and we could remove them when they left the company and all kinds of nice things like that. Um, and the plan was that we were going to deploy all of this to all of production on a Friday afternoon. <laughs> yeah. So I know that this is a bad idea, in hindsight, and I knew it was a bad idea at the time. But it was the last day of the project and we wanted to get something really, really great done. And we were pretty confident. There was a whole bunch of processes that we had been through. We tested it in all the environments. We got all of the approvals. All of the boxes were ticked. We were ready to go. So we deployed the change. And we watched all of the results roll in and everything was coming back green, green, green. And we tried logging onto the servers using the old root password and it was fine. And we tried logging onto the servers using our new username and password, and that was fine, so we hadn't locked anyone out, but the new thing worked, and everything was going great. And so basically, we just had to sit there and wait for about 90 minutes, and then we could go to the pub. And that was going to be the end of the engagement. So we started sitting and waiting, and at about T minus 45 minutes from going to the pub, uh, the phone rang, and they said, hey, Nobody in my department can save PDFs anymore. We're all at a complete standstill because nobody can save PDFs. And I sort of thought, what? How could we possibly have broken the ability to save PDFs? We touched the back-end Linux fleet. This is Windows laptops we're talking about. They should have had nothing to do with each other. And so I asked a few more questions and it turns out that they're not clicking file, save as PDF, they're clicking file, print, and then from the list of physical printers in the office, they're selecting PDF printer, and then a PDF is magically being produced. And so we had to work out what this was and why it was there. And so we started, and how we'd broken it. And so we started with the most obvious thing, which was ask, and nobody had any idea what this thing was, but they had a wiki, and so we checked the wiki and it has all of the details of everything they're responsible for and how to reboot it and upgrade it and stuff. And it's not in the wiki. But they have a CMDB and everything is in the CMDB because it has to be in the CMDB and it's not in the CMDB. <laughs> and so all we had was the IP address of this printer. And so we tried to log into it and we were presented with a blinking light that said password. And so we typed in the root password that's been the same for 10 years, and it let us in. Uh, and so what followed was a particularly complicated session of infrastructure paleontology, which sort of much like regular paleontology is more tedious and less interesting than Indiana Jones uh, makes it look. But in the end, we worked out how the bones of this thing fit together when it was alive, and it turns out this is a physical server that was put in the data center about 10 years ago, and its job is to pretend to be a printer and when somebody prints to it, it saves it all to a PDF and copies it to a file and runs a script and the script moves it to a mount point and the mount point's mounted on a NAS and the NAS is mounted to their laptops. And so, to the user, it looks like it saves to their laptop but actually it does this horrible dance all the way around the network and back again. And so now we had to fix it. Turns out the fix was quite simple. 
We just had to change thousands of permissions on the network share. <laughs> Uh, and so that was reasonably terrifying. Uh, that was a, what we would call a roll forward. Um, but the first thing to do then was to work out, all right, what else depends on this folder and the network share and the permissions being the way they are? And are we going to make it worse? Um, and unsurprisingly, given that finding out that this thing existed was near impossible, finding out what depended on it was absolutely impossible. And everybody had gone home by this point. So we decided we're not going to make it any worse. So we did it. And everything was fine. Uh, it actually fixed everything and nothing else broke and it was okay. But not before the entire department went home without getting the stuff done they were supposed to get done. So it wasn't okay exactly. Anyway, we made it to the pub in the end and we thought about how could we have avoided this or if not avoided it, at least discovered it before the users did and maybe even fixed it before the users uh, noticed. And we thought, well, certainly we would never have thought to test for it beforehand because it's just so stupid that if somebody came to me and said, hey, what if, what if there's a thing pretending to be a printer and saving these things to a PDF and copying it and doing all this stuff? I would have thought, if, you, if I was to check for that, I would have to check for everything under the sun and I'd never get anything done. So we wouldn't have checked for it even if someone told us to. And this sort of represents a really good example of an unknown unknown, which is something that you don't know that you don't know. It's such an esoteric problem. It's never going to happen to anyone again, I hope. <laughs> but it's part of a class of esoteric problems that actually happen all the time. And what I realized at this point was that our industry is not super good at dealing with these sorts of super esoteric problems that tend to only happen once. Um, and I thought I had a way to fix it, so I quit my job and I started the company that I work for now. But before we go into that, we need to talk a little bit about the problem. So firstly, we need to talk about mental models. So a mental model is what allows us to predict what the outputs of a system will be for a given set of inputs. For example, I have a mental model of how driving a car works. I know that if I press the accelerator, it will speed up, and if I press the brake, it'll slow down. But I didn't develop that mental model by taking the engine apart and looking at all of the component pieces and predicting how they were going to interact. I developed the mental model by driving a car. And this is how the mental models of our applications and our systems tend to be built as well, through experience in operating them, not through first principles. However, just like no amount of driving a car makes you a mechanic, the mental models that are built from experience often don't prepare us for when things go wrong. Wood's theorem states that as the co complexity of a system increases, the accuracy of any single agent's own model of that system, mental model of that system, decreases rapidly. Um, Woods himself actually conducted a workshop that delved into a bunch of outages and the roles that mental models played. Uh, I thoroughly recommend reading it. It's called The Stellar Report. I have a few physical copies if you're into that sort of thing. Otherwise, you can Google it. Um, they studied a bunch of outages and they found that these five things were common across all outages. And I'm going to read through them because they're important. In all cases, each anomaly arose from unanticipated, unappreciated interactions between system components. There was no root cause. Anomalies arose from multiple latent factors which combined to cause a problem. The vulnerabilities themselves were present for weeks or months before they played a part in the evolution of the anomaly. The vulnerabilities were activated by specific events, conditions or situations and those activators were minor events, near nominal operating conditions or only slightly off nominal situations. And in all of these cases, the outage caused what he called fundamental surprise in which the situation you are presented with refutes your most basic beliefs about how the system works and you need to rebuild your mental model from scratch in order to fix it. These are the 
unknown unknowns. And now I don't think that it was a coincidence that every single one of these outages was caused by unknown unknowns. I think that they will always, outages will always happen at the edge of your mental model with the things that you don't know you don't know. Because if you knew about it, you wouldn't have got yourself into that situation in the first place. If I knew that the PDF printer thing existed, I certainly wouldn't have done it. Even if I know that I don't know something about how a system will behave, which is a known unknown, I can still prepare for it. If I know that I don't know how this particular upgrade is going to work, I can practice the upgrade. And then I can move it into the known known section. But by definition, I can't do this with the unknown unknowns because I don't know them. Um, and so it sort of looks like it can't be solved. And in fact, it's even worse than that. Because as we improve our mental models, we understand and prevent the simple ways in which our systems can break, which leave only the complex ways. We move all the simple problems into known knowns and the stuff that lives in unknown unknowns is the really, really nasty stuff. So by improving our understanding, we're actually making our outages more complex. Now to our credit, we are probably making them less frequent, but they are getting more complex. And this still isn't the worst part. Management have not found out about this yet. And when they do, they do this. So those outages were caused by unknown unknowns, but we need to think about how it must look to management. We followed all the processes and something still went wrong. So how do we fix that? More processes. More processes. And it leads to processes that basically amount to getting so many fingerprints on the gun that when it finally does go off, they can't pin it on anybody. <laughs> By <laughs> then, you most probably implicated ten times or more. Exactly, exactly. It's more about distributing blame than it is about building confidence. If you laughed, I'm assuming that you've seen this happen, but I'm going to explain how it works. Firstly, a company experiences an outage and they add some process to try and avoid it. This increases the lead time. Now, compared to high performing companies, low performing companies that participate heavily in risk management theatre, have a 440 times longer lead time, which means they have a lower deployment frequency. A lower deployment frequency means that every single change needs to be 46 times bigger if they are to compete with their high performing counterparts. Now, spoiler, they don't compete, but the changes are still bigger. Larger changes and less practice in doing them means that they're five times more likely to fail and all of the above means that when they do go wrong, they go wrong in a big way, taking 96 times longer to recover from. And this is the real demon here. The fact that the result of this process is another bigger outage. And remember, the thing that caused this process was an outage to begin with. So it's a positive feedback loop that just sort of runs away until you have so much process that you can't do anything. If any of you have worked in I mean, it, it happens everywhere. Show your hands if you've, you've seen this in action. Yeah, I thought so. <laughs> yeah, it's a, money is involved. Yes, yes, it's, it sucks. And I really don't like it. Um, these numbers, by the way, are from the 2017 Puppet State of DevOps report. They focus specifically on risk management theater in that year. Um, but anyway, so that is what happens. So how can we fix it? Well. We've got pretty good tools for using our mental models when problems occur. Observability tools are a really good example of this. They let us see the outputs, metrics, traces, logs, and we can apply our mental model to infer what must the internal state of this system be in order for it to produce those outputs. But of course it requires a mental model, which we know we won't have when something is broken because it will have refuted our mental model. And the Stellar report found that this was the case. All of the companies they studied had observability tools and other abstractions, but they found that when there was an outage, every single one of them went to what they called primal interactions, which basically means using the command line. And what are they doing when they're using the command line? 
They're not looking at logs because they've already got the logs and that didn't help. They're looking at the inputs, the configuration. Um, there's a potentially uh, dubious but nonetheless sort of right feeling Gartner statistic that says that 80% of our outages are caused by configuration. Um, but the configuration is also where all of the how the application is supposed to work information lives, which is what helps us to rebuild our mental models in these situations. That's things like what database does this service point to, what security group is it in, all that sort of stuff. If we had tools that monitored our inputs, as well as observability tools that monitor our outputs, we'd be able to do things like immediately look at whether or not a settings changed, find out who changed it and whether it might have caused an outage. We could build mental models on the fly before we made a change, rather than having to maintain a massive mental model in our heads. So, at this point I imagine some of you are probably thinking, yeah, but I've got good documentation, I use config management, doesn't that sort of solve it? If somebody wants to know how it works, they can read the code. And they do mitigate the problem a little bit, but they're not really a solution. Um, documentation is basically the best way we have of taking our mental model and putting it down somewhere so that somebody else can sort of import that mental model into their brains when they need to. Um, but does anybody want to bet that their documentation is entirely correct and up to date and 100% covering everything? <laughs> no, doubt it. Yeah, I didn't think so. It's a, good, it's a good way to do it, but it is really, really difficult. There's also config management, which can get you some of the way. If you've got good coverage, if everything is automated, you can sort of look at your code and, and understand the system, but in reality, your Terraform code is never this simple. This is a variable, and this is a variable, and this is a variable, and they come from other places, and you've got to chase them all down, and it's all in a module, and um, you spend more time chasing down what's the value of this variable than you do actually learning about the system. So, in theory, it works. In practice, not so much. It's often easier to just check the AWS console. So, the common thing between these two that makes them not a solution is the fact that they're abstractions. When we're building a system, that's a good thing. We have to have abstractions. Config management is good because it allows us to abstract away the infrastructure in the same way that developers abstract away their code. It allows us to compartmentalize our mental models and treat things as a black box where I say, give me a certificate and it gives me a certificate and I don't need to know how it works. Documentation sort of follows this pattern too. We document what our mental model of the thing is, but not necessarily all the intricate details of how it works, just sort of the inputs and outputs. Um, but when we have to fix systems, we know from before that the outages tend to occur outside of our mental models. They tend to refute what our mental models are. So stuff like documentation um, and config management and any sort of abstraction ends up getting in the way because the problems always find a way to go exactly between the cracks of the abstractions that we've built. Um, as I said, the Stellar Report found even with abstractions, people use primal tools. Uh, so what is the solution? I've been trying to solve this for the past coming up on two years. Um, now, we can't predict what the outage is going to be, which means we can't really practice for a specific outage. We can, however, improve our general troubleshooting tools. And this is something that I think that we don't do enough. Often we focus on preventing an outage from ever happening again. But to prevent the printer thing from ever happening again, I mean, it's never going to happen again whether you do anything about it or not. It's super esoteric. Probably it would be better to invest our time in maybe using chaos engineering principles to cause real problems but not tell the team which chaos engineering thing you use to cause it so that they have to both troubleshoot and resolve the thing rather than just having Chaos Monkey turn a bunch of stuff off and you know that the solution is turned back on. Also running regular training and drills, um, either develop your own internal training where people develop troubleshooting skills, not specific but general ones, um, or use something like Uptime Labs where you have like a pre-canned thing where you can go and learn troubleshooting skills. But a lot of the time when you're doing this, the time is spent trying to just discover the information. 
rather than interpret it. A lot of the time you're trying to find the right place in the console to click to get the, to get the thing you're looking for. Um, and so there are ways to make your config easier to discover. You could use Cloud Query, for example, to dump your entire AWS estate into a SQL database and then query it with SQL. You could do that every hour and then you could use it to query changes. Um, that's a fair bit easier than hitting 100 AWS APIs when something is going wrong, you already have it written down. Similarly, if you're using Kubernetes, you could just dump all the kubectl output to a Git repo. It sounds kind of dumb, but if you're looking for, oh God, where are all the places that this thing is mentioned, it's a hell of a lot easier under pressure to just control F a big folder of text files than it is to go into Kubernetes and remember the commands and stuff like that. So making your infrastructure easy to discover under pressure will help quite a lot with rebuilding these mental models. The harder part with this is working out the relationships. Dumping it all to a big uh, table is kind of easy and probably pretty helpful, but the relationships are a little bit harder. This is what I've been working on solving mostly. The way that I've come up with solving it is sort of the way a web crawler works. If you imagine an HTTP endpoint as like a piece of data, there's a few breadcrumbs here that we could follow to get more related information. We could, it's got a certificate, we could look at the certificate. It's got a DNS entry, the DNS entry resolved to an IP address, and we can sort of keep expanding out and build a big graph of how everything is related so that we don't have to do this under pressure. We can work out what potentially could, is related to this um, immediately. Once we have this information, we can do some pretty interesting things, even if the user doesn't tell us anything about their infrastructure or their applications. Of course, they're not gonna be able to tell us because the outage has refuted their mental model, so we can't rely on the user. But what we can do is we can do things like take the output of a Terraform plan, look at what things it's going to touch, and then tell the user what are all of the things that depend on that thing, and what do you need to be looking at when you deploy it. We can take a snapshot of things before and after and give somebody a diff of what is the actual infrastructure impact of this change rather than just not what have you done but what, how has everything behaved in response. If we do this for all of our changes, we can also build up a big database of all the changes we've made, the impact they've had, and then query back on that. And because we're not snapshotting the whole infrastructure, we're just snapshotting the stuff that's related to our change, it's not going to be petabytes and petabytes of mostly useless data. Um, that's what I've been working on for the last two years. That's what we're building now. The, uh, specifically the Terraform impact analysis part, it is so close to being ready. Um, if it's something that interests you, come and speak to me afterwards. We're looking for design partners if you're using Terraform and AWS. That's what we're gonna support out of the gate. Um, that's enough about that though. So, what did we learn? We learned that outages will always happen outside of our mental models. They'll always be caused by the thing that you didn't know that you didn't know, because otherwise you wouldn't have done the thing in the first place. Therefore, tools that require mental models to use don't help, because the outage has made you question everything about how the system works. Therefore, we need to make our systems more discoverable on the fly. When things are broken, we need to be able to discover the config and the changes and the dependencies as quickly as we can so that we can solve it more quickly. So if you take anything out of this talk today, um, think about this next time there's a problem. How could I have made it easier to rebuild my mental model? Read the Stella report. It's uh, S-T-E-L-L-A. Come and speak to me if you want a physical copy. I have a couple ones that I've bound. Um, it's really worth reading. And that is about it. Thank you. Great stuff, Dylan. Great stuff. Thank you. Um, right. Does anybody have any questions? For Wow. Straight away, before I even ask the question. Um, let's go over here. Um, are you all right going to the lectern mic oh, yeah. to answer? Um, yes. I'll, I'll pass the mic Can you hear me? Are you taking the other mic off? Does this work? Oh, hang on, one moment. Hang on. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. Are you yes. taking the video mic off? 
That's still here. Still there. Thanks, Raj. Question. Yeah, and what's your opinion about hiring red team or penetration testers to trigger out cages to avoid them in the future? I've never actually heard of penetration testers triggering outages. That's a really interesting one, like deliberately taking something down, like DDoSing something, I guess that makes sense. Um, that's probably not a bad way to do it, especially if you can do that in a controlled manner. It is going to give you excellent practice in what is a real life situation. Um, it's gonna be expensive because you're hiring an external company to do it. If you can do it more repeatably and more cheaply as part of your onboarding, I'd recommend finding some way to do that. I don't have a great number of answers. I think that um, at the last OOPS event, listening to um, the firefighter talk about how they do training, it just sort of made me realize how bad we are as an industry at training people to deal in these situations. But that'd be a great way to do it, I think, um, if you have the, the time and the money. Thank you. Brilliant, thank you. Cool, we've got another mic over here. So um, I don't know what, I'll come and get it. That's all right. Thank you, that makes things easier. All right, so, uh, so Mr. Hardy, you can hold your hand up, didn't you? You go, so you go that back. Thanks. Oh, we've got one each. Yes. Okay, I'm only asking you to just like go t shirt. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm the judge. Now, in, addition, in addition to the four quadrants we all know, there's a fifth one which I like to add. It's like kind of a blob in the middle, a shapeless morass blob in the middle, which is the known but uncommunicated. And this goes all the way back up your supply chain, right to the top of shit that suppliers know about but don't tell you. <laughs> and then we come to what you discussed about the mental models. Now, as Nassim Taleb is very fond of pointing out with four quadrant black swan problems, your next big hit will not resemble your last big hit because you mitigated the last big hit. And mitigation of fourth quadrant problems is an area of myth and legend because you can't strictly mitigate against what you don't know. But what you can do is mitigate about how bad the effect might be. Now you talked about the process overburden getting in the way. There's another one which is architectural complexity and tight coupling. If you've read Charles Perrault's excellent work called Normal Accidents, which was based on what nearly blew up Three Mile Island, the problem was cascading failures producing a blizzard of alerts that people couldn't discover the root cause. Architecturally loose coupling is your best protection against those fourth quadrant problems by limiting the blast radius. Discuss. I couldn't agree more. I, I would like you to come and re tell me what the name of those things are. I hadn't read either of them, so I want to write them down. Um, I just want to agree completely wholeheartedly with the, the amorphous blob in the middle of the four quadrants. Everybody has their own four quadrants, and something that is an unknown unknown for you might not be for somebody else, but if they're in a different time zone, it might as well be. Um, so yeah, it's important to remember that as an organization, it does, it's not that clean. As a person, an individual, yes, but have you been told everything? Uh, yeah, that it's, an, it's an excellent point I didn't bring up. Okay, so, um, yeah. Do t-shirt now. Prizes for, <laughs> do we allow prizes for, for theses? I think I'm nice to say that. Um, nice one, Andrew, thank you. Um, I, I see you, Hamid. Uh, any more questions further back? Um, let's go here. Whoops, what have I told on? Oh, that's fine. <laughs> Sorry. Yes, legacy stuff. That was where I came from. That's my sort of uh, my bread and butter. Legacy is a hell of a lot harder to query with an API, um, and a hell of a lot harder to write integrations for. So, as a company of four people, we are doing the easy thing first, which is AWS and Terraform. Um, but I do sort of love legacy infrastructure, and I think it would be really good. Um, a lot of the stuff that we're that we're building is open source, like the way it. Um, queries things and um, so I'm kind of hoping people will want to help but maybe we'll do it ourselves it depends on the priority I totally agree though and I would love to solve it for legacy stuff good 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 okay I just got a hammer uh, very nice to be here by the way uh, I would like you to ask, uh, answer the question you know as you said for example just towards the end that 
us engineers as an industry, we're really bad at actually like you know predicting anything, isn't it? Completely psychologically. So you take it. They should always look at any sort of a problem with a, a black sheet of paper. As you said, for example, at Puppet you had an issue, okay? But you see, the thing is that you never know that uh, any other uh, development team that came before you, they must have done something, uh, or they must have implemented a few systems which you might not have had no idea about. One, secondly, and even as you know, uh, as you know that uh, you know a lot we don't tend to uh, properly document, as I said, yes, properly do we? Do we? <laughs> So that's my sort of like two pence actually. So at the end of the day, what's the question? Um, <laughs> about the like, about the us being bad at, at sort of teaching people to think in a way that uh, causes us to troubleshoot effectively. I sort of feel like I can troubleshoot effectively, and I was before I came here today. I was trying to think about why I think I'm good at that, and I couldn't even justify why I think I'm good at it, let alone teach it to somebody else. I tried to Google, I couldn't find anything. So if anybody has any resources for how to teach people how to think such that they troubleshoot effectively, come and speak to me afterwards. I would love to know what it is. I reckon it's really difficult. All right, okay. Um, I think we better wrap there because we're a little bit on, over on time. So, um, sorry, Raj, sorry for the other questions. Um, you can ask them afterwards. Um, so, brilliant. Thank you, Dylan. Thank no you. worries.